Evet. İstanbul 95 adını verdiğimiz ve uzun bir soluklu bir projenin ilk konuşması bugün. E, bu proje Bernard Fenler Vakfı ile beraber yürütülüyor. E, vakfın e, özellikle çalıştığı konu erken çocukluk dönemi e, ve şehirlerin 95 santimden eğer bakabilseydik neyi değiştirirdik, e, neyle e, neyi ön plana alırdık, neyi ön, önceliğimiz olurdu e, bunu e, soruyor hem belediye başkanlarına hem tasarımcılara. E, aktivistlere. Sabahleyin belediye başkanlarıyla bir toplantımız vardı. E, şimdi buradayız. E, uzun soluklu içerisinde bir yarışmanın da olacağı bir süreç tasarlamaya çalışıyoruz. E, İstanbul'daki parklar nasıl değişebilir diye. E, özellikle kamusal alan üzerinde konuşacağız. Biz de önümüzdeki e, 12 aylık süreçte e, takip ederseniz yine bu kalabalık, bu güzel kalabalıkla tekrar bizimle olursanız çok seviniriz. I'll switch to English. Um, uh, thank you, Daryl, for being with us tonight. Uh, I just gave a brief introduction on the Istanbul 95 project, and uh, uh, I hope you will tell us a little bit more about the foundation uh, as well. Um, Daryl is one of the persons with the biggest heart I have seen uh, met in the recent years. It's a pleasure uh, to to have you here. Um, I think the the story he's going to tell us is of uh, building uh, about 17,000 parks. Uh, in in the US but at the same time uh, building that with the community uh, and I think uh, it takes a big heart to to do the type of work uh, Daryl is doing um, I thank you for that I thank you for sharing that with us today um, stage is yours Great. <clears throat> thank you and good evening uh, can everybody hear me uh, I'm also excited about being here and I must admit I didn't think that I'd see so many uh, faces out there so I know that the one of the choices that you have is how you spend to choose your time, choose to spend your time, and for you to uh, come here tonight uh, really honors the work that we're trying to do. Um, I'm with the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, particularly a program called Urban 95, and the foundation has been around uh, for about 60 years, and it really was started by an industrialist, and the industrialist was really interested in, particularly right after World War II, how to make the world better. Uh, after he saw and knew so much decimation that had happened, um, how can humanity heal itself? And the foundation was started after uh, that experience and the success of um, his business. And particularly the Urban 95 program is a new program that the foundation is trying to do because after many years of experience and working in early childhood development and having a lot of success, uh, we didn't see that success actually ripping, rippling to making kids a priority. And if we made kids a priority, how then might we re redefine resources and redistribute resources for them in a different way? And so Urban 95 is literally looking at the world from 95 centimeters. And what would you do differently if you were looking at the world through those lens? Uh, interestingly, the only maybe thing that we all have in common is at one point we were 95 centimeters. We come from different parts of the world, um, but we were all 95 centimeters at one point. And at that point, there's a lot of things and choices um, that we could have done and that we've made about how we choose to live our life, where we choose to live our life, but you are a child. And in some places, Children don't have as good of opportunity as we think they could have, particularly because we're tying the built environment to what's happening in the brain. And we know more about now what's happening in the brain, particularly the first 1,000 days of a kid's life. And in those 1,000 days, there's so many neutrons that are firing in your brain and two things happen. Either they connect and strengthen, which means they're there with you forever, or they atrophy and go away. And learning and play in relationships is one of the best ways to make those things connect. And so as childhood is changing, um, we want the built environment to keep up with the changes, but also make sure the built environment works for the youngest amongst us. And so Urban 95 Istanbul and our Istanbul program, who's led by my colleague Yeet uh, back there, is really trying to change the conversation on one hand, and that conversation being that kids matter, and all kids matter, and particularly the youngest amongst us. 
pregnant women, babies, in that first 1,000 days, how can we be more intentional about directing the built environment that set them up for further success? And I'm going to come back uh, to that in a minute because I'm going to take you on a little bit of journey about how I got here. And it goes back a long ways where when I was 18, uh, one year old, my mother gave birth to the youngest of those Hammond kids and the, I was the seventh, so the eighth was on the way. And uh, my father left my mother and us, our family to care for ourselves. And my mother, for as hard as she tried, had a nervous breakdown and could no longer care for us. So I got shipped 4,000 miles away from where we were born to a group home. Um, and it was a community that for 14 years raised me. It wasn't like a community maybe that a lot of us are familiar with, with homes or apartments and moms and dads and brothers and sisters, but nonetheless it was a community. And it was through that community that embedded in me this strong ethic of it was a community that raised me and when it was going to be my opportunity to give back, I needed to give back so that any other kid like me got as much equal opportunity. I went to college, dropped out, flunked out, got kicked out. The story has changed over time uh, with the more success that I've had. Uh, but uh, I, I then went to the south side of Chicago. And I was literally 19 years old and started to organize on the south side of Chicago um, through a different means. And the means was, instead of asking people um, what they didn't like about their space, what was going wrong about their space, what they may fix about that space, we said, what do you like about your space? And interestingly, it didn't take them long to come up with great ideas. We asked them, what skill do you have that maybe people don't know that you have? And it was interesting to watch them delight in somebody asking them that question to try to discover something different about them as a human. Not just as a research subject, or not just getting information from you. And from that, what we started to see was amongst these communities that a lot of times get beaten down and beaten up in the media, and they do it to themselves, we saw a lot of strengths. We saw a lot of gifts. And so we started to connect the people who wanted to learn to cook with people who were in their same building that were great cooks and were willing to teach other people how to cook. We started to connect kids to musicians that nobody knew played the guitar or the piano, but they were willing to share their talents and skill with somebody else. And before you know it, how the community saw themselves, not about how everybody else saw themselves, but how they saw themselves started to change. And to some degree, the prison that many people felt like they lived in, because that was the picture painted around some of these housing developments, may became stark places, but they were places of people and humanity that shared a common sense that it's up to us to raise the next generation. It's up to us to make sure that our future generation is maybe better cared for than our current generation, but we're not going to complain about it. We're going to do something about it. And so as an organizer on the south side of Chicago, uh, I had this epiphany where I was looking for something that was a definable project on a definable timeline. Because a lot of consultants and research institutions go to places like this and they ask these questions and then maybe master plans get developed and little action takes place. And I was more about the action. And I was more about how we could get the community to continue to fight for something than fighting against something. So lo and behold, we started, it wasn't me who came up with the idea that regular community members with no technical skills, with enough of them, and the right type of coaching, mentoring, and support could actually build a playground together. And over 20 years, we literally perfected that process to over 17,000 playgrounds 
uh, that our organization was honored to be a part of all across uh, North America. And the recipe was really simple, to be quite honest. Uh, it's meeting people where they're at, don't making assumptions about what they know or they don't know. It's about uh, giving them a common cause, the well-being of kids. Everybody can take a ground and say, I want for the kids to have better than what I have. So that common cause. Achievable wins. Um, a lot of times, including myself at 20 years old, 21 years old, didn't have the skills necessary and I had to ask other people for help. And asking for help was okay. It didn't, it, it wasn't admission. Um, it was more of a vulnerability. And if you allow yourself to be vulnerable, the help comes to you. But a lot of times, when it's the type of people that we're trying to organize, that vulnerability is really painful because everybody has imposed things about them on them and they've never really owned it. So asking for help was really challenging. So giving them achievable wins that really make sense for them that build confidence. And the achievable wins could be things like, you know, um, I've never been on a food committee before, but if you want somebody to volunteer, the best way to get them to show up is tell them that breakfast, lunch, and dinner will be provided. And if you don't provide food, it won't be as good of an experience. If you provide food, people will show up and they'll stay. And so you have to have a committee of people who are either going to make the food or get food donated from local restaurants. And for somebody who's never asked for a donation before, even if it's a monetary or an in-kind contribution or ask somebody to volunteer, that can be a really intimidating thing. But doing it in such small steps where you set it up where they have success or if they don't have success, it's such a small failure that they're willing to do it again versus the overall project being a failure. And so those achievable wins build on to this thing of the final step was this cascading steps of confidence and courage. And when you have confidence and courage, no matter where you're from, what you're doing, if you're a university um, student to a university professor to a CEO, the things that you do and how you do that and how you walk around, carry yourself, and what you do is absolutely transformational. And that's what we wanted to do in these communities. That's what we wanted to see kids to see in their parents, for kids to see in their neighbors and their grandparents, that confidence. So much so that one of the first projects that I worked on was in San Antonio, Texas, and a woman was 72 years old, Ray Hood, uh, when I met her. And she uh, talked about literally a, a train track that divided her mainly African-American community with the other side of the train track being the highest income in San Antonio. And for safety reasons, they built a fence. But on the other side of the fence and this train track happened to be the nicest playground in town. So her kids could no longer cross the train tracks and play at the playground anymore. And she asked them to take down the fence and they said no, for safety reasons. And so at 72 years old, as an elder in the church, she went to look for another solution. And without finding, before finding us, she said, the need in the community is a playground. We're going to get a playground is equally as good as the playground on the other side of the track. And for two years, Ray Hood and the elders of the Baptist Church in San Antonio raised money, worked hard, and on a, a weekend constructed a playground where the success was, interestingly and ironically, the fence came down because the kids on that side of the tracks wanted to play on the cool playground on this side of the tracks. And Ray Hood's reaction to that was, we won. We're not going to stop them. Kids don't know the difference. And us adults should know the difference that just because you did it to us doesn't mean we're going to end up doing it to you. Uh, I started out to build an organizing organization. And the playground was a byproduct of getting people to come together around the common cause, the well-being of kids. And after doing that, um, we ended up being the largest purchaser of playgrounds in the United States. Uh, we were second for a long time to McDonald's. And we actually surpassed McDonald's in purchasing of playground equipment. 
And it really led to this awakening as a nonprofit organization to say, how do you become a market maker? And the market maker being, is there more need for just playgrounds? Or should the playgrounds that we build be actually better playgrounds? Because if we're really honest with ourselves and as many playgrounds as we've built, um, not all of them got maximized and used as often or as much as we would have liked them to be. Because kids' play patterns were changing. Childhood was changing. And playgrounds were not. Actually, they were changing for the worse because the safety standards was making it even harder to innovate, be creative. And the industry didn't want to take any risk, didn't want to take any liability. At the same time, the organization didn't want to lose our focus on community building. That's what brought us to where we were at, and we just needed to figure out how not to lose that, but at the same time, build better playgrounds. And in building better playgrounds, we went to the industry, we asked them to do design competitions, and frankly, we got more of the same. Nothing new. And we finally found an architect uh, in New York City who had just given birth to their second child. And he would take uh, both of the children to the playground. is almost a relaxation for himself because he knew why they were at the playground. They'd be occupied. And being occupied, he could do something else. And so he'd go to the playground almost as often, as frequently as he could, because he'd get a moment of rest. And what he saw over a couple of year period was the playground got boring for the kids. And they wouldn't play as long as they had played before. And he wasn't getting the rest that he actually needed and deserved and desired to be able to get that. And so being a designer and being an architect, he said there's got to be a better playground. There's got to be a better playground. And he took pen to paper and he designed all these sketches, yet he'd go home and he'd find his two kids uh, who were increasingly almost every day taking every box that they had in their New York apartment and turning it into a tunnel, a cave, a castle. And these cardboard boxes kept them interested, engaged. It flared their imagination and made them cooperate and collaborate. And he said, the playground of the future is cardboard boxes. And from cardboard boxes became a product known as Imagination Playground, designed by the architect David Rockwell. And we went through a process of iterating on the cardboard box to creating this set of uh, instruments, foam instruments, that didn't snap together because we didn't want it to limit how people were going to be able to use it. We wanted it to be anything a kid could make it to be. We wanted it to be, or specifically he wanted it to be, um, something that his kids would play with. And if they played with it, they played with it for a long time. And by playing with it for a long time, and very often, they were also building their brain. They were figuring out problems. They were communicating and collaborating with each other, sometimes verbally and many times not. They were building pride in their own work. And so Kaboom, as an organization, actually brought that product um, to the marketplace and, and built a for-profit business um, out of that. And at that time, the playground industry was, was thinking that they may lose us as a customer and said, we better get serious about actually thinking about what is the public playground and public space playground of the future and work differently. But that's the power of a nonprofit organization that doesn't lose where it's come from, yet at the same time recognizes where it's at and then tries to use its influence uh, in a different way. And in that different way, we probably weren't as successful as we had wanted or had hoped, to be quite honest. The product is a great product. It sells very well. It's all over the world. Uh, but it's not scaled enough that's changing the way kids play. And so what we came up with on the next point was we have good community building. We need not just more playgrounds, we need better playgrounds. Um, we decided to go to the actual experts, kids themselves. Because who we would talk to about playgrounds before them was the people who were buying them. 
parks and recs department, school maintenance staff, the facilities um, department, uh, a general developer or contractor, and they were guessing what kids may want. They actually didn't know what kids wanted. And the difference was you had a customer who was paying and a user, and you had a broken link that the customer who was paying didn't actually know what the feature or benefit was gonna be for the user. And the user was voting with their feet by not staying at the playground very long, or B, not coming back as frequently as they would to the cardboard boxes. And so we started to, again, have this inquiry about if we talk to kids and ask kids, what would they tell us? And what they told us was really interesting. It came down to, they see the whole playground, the whole city as their playground, not just the park or playground that they maybe go to. And I'm gonna show a couple of slides um, just on this, but essentially this is a decision tree um, that talks about if we need kids to be um, active minds, active bodies, and socially active together, um, they need to play. Play is a great antidote, and I could go into all of these statistics about why play matters, but I'll let you, this is not a speech on play. But the decision tree for play has all of these yes or no prompts. And in a lot of times, once you get to know, play doesn't happen for kids. Um, so you have to decide to play, you have to get ready to go play, weather becomes a factor, the distance becomes a factor, and all of these things become factors that kids don't make. The adults are making it for the kids. And so this hassle factor ironically stops in what we found a majority of the instances where the parent knows it's good for the child to go play and that they should go play, the hassle factor gets in the way of them actually going to play because it's a burden on them. And so out of that um, came some inquiry around this notion of walkability, bikeability. What is playability? And if the kids see anything that they do along the way, like going to the grocery store, standing at the bus stop, going to a laundromat as play, why aren't we thinking about those places for kids to play as well? And um, the three factors that you can see there is that we found that parents told us that play gets lost in daily schedules, which is that time crunch. And we all do this ourselves. And as our schedules start to overwhelm us, the choices that we make is about what's easiest. And play was not the easiest choice to make. It's hard to know if you're playing enough. And a lot of times, particularly when we're thinking about childhood, one of the things that's happening is that everybody wants an immediate benefit. If I read a book, what do I learn? If I play, what benefit do I get out of it right now? It's like grading a test. What's my grade? Play, a lot of times, doesn't have that immediate benefit. It's the long-term and cumulative benefit that's happening both to their minds, their bodies, and their socialization that adds up. And again, the hassle factors get in the way. So we started to think about uh, play everywhere, and three things became true. We needed to um, foster uh, play everywhere, make cities family-friendly, and create this corner store of play. And this is when we really started to think about this and took a, a, a, an interesting inquiry into um, where kids actually, what do they do during the day? You know, particularly low income kids or uh, you know, informal settlement kids. Who are they with? Where do they go? What does that look like? And we went and followed a whole bunch of kids. And how long were they here? And we followed them over and over, day after day, and week after week, and month after month, because we wanted to not make a snap judgment, but we wanted to recognize patterns. And in recognizing patterns, what we generally found was the greatest moments of frustration for their parent also became a frustration for their kid, that if you turn those into moments of joy, standing in line, waiting for a buzz, waiting for your clothes to dry, it could be a positive experience both for the child and for the parent. And so we were putting play everywhere instead of making them go to the playground to get play. 
And interestingly, when we started to do that, they exercised this play muscle where their benefits were much more obvious. They were happier. The parents were less stressed because they were happier and they weren't required to do as much caregiving uh, for the parent. And I say this because I know many of you are interested in design, architecture. Uh, we came up with the six different um, um, things that we didn't see was being uh, for child-friendly cities as kind of principles. Um, and the principles are actually quite easy. Convenient. Is it easy to get to because if it's hard, you've created a hassle and a burden? Is it inviting? Does it say kids are welcome here? Or does it say play safe? Don't run. Don't jump. No kids allowed. No skateboarding. If we put out those messages, sometimes kids are actually going to believe us and not do those things. So you literally have to provide an invitation for them to do that. This next one is around wondrous. And this was the most surprising actually to me, that kids seek mastery. And mastery means increasing levels of challenge. And um, playgrounds um, have become somewhat so safe that there's no longer mastery. When I was a young child, I loved slides because it wasn't just about going down the slide, it was simply going down the slide so that you could walk back up it. Now, it's hard to walk back up the slide because you've got to put a safety hood on there, which requires you to sit down when you slide, makes it harder for you to walk back up. Kids know what's happening. It's so safe that they ought not to do it anymore, and it's no longer wondrous, and you don't seek mastery in it, which is why video games is such an interesting thing. Uh, I often get asked the question, what's the best type of play for kids? It's actually a re rather simple question. The best type of play for kids is all types of play for kids, not simple one type of play. And the problem that our world is moving towards is that we're giving all of one type of play. We're giving all of sports, or we're giving all of electronics. Electronics are actually good for kids, as long as it's in moderation. Sports is good for kids, even though they may not like sports, as long as it's in moderation. Variety, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. It's got to be challenging because kids know the difference. If it's not challenging, it's also equal to wondrous. Um, share, social. Um, if it's not social, including for the parent or the caregiver, um, uh, we're creating silos and isolation. And what kids crave is other kids. And when kids have other kids, they're generally happy and can make something to do. So how in public space, how in playground design, are we either encouraging socialization or discouraging socialization? And frankly, we do a lot in public space design that discourages socialization. If we don't want people to sleep in benches, we put bars um, so that only one person can sit. And go to any airport in the world where there used to be long benches, but now they're individual seats. The reason they're individual sleep seats is we don't want people sleeping on it if their plane is delayed and they have to sleep overnight. We do a lot as designers and architects to prevent socialization. How can we do as much thinking about positive interactions of socialization? After the riots in LA in 1996, there was this movement that literally went through all the vacant lots in Watts, the community where the riots actually took place, and paved them over and fenced them. And the reason they paved them over and fenced them, they didn't want people to congregate. They didn't want people to socialize. They were trying to drive people away from public space instead of making the public space inviting. Because what happened when people came together in public space, they weren't happy with what was happening. Uh, and started to demonstrate. Uh, the final point, is it unifying? Does it bring the whole community together? And you really want the whole community to be involved. And Urban 95 is specifically bringing to the conversation and to the table very young kids um, who aren't often at the table. Uh, I'm currently working 
uh, with uh, somebody who went to two international schools, uh, Harvard being one and uh, another school in the Netherlands. Uh, he has uh, four years of undergraduate, uh, two years of master's, and three years of his doctoral thesis around planning cities, cities of the future. He's never once had a class that had kids as part of the discussion or conversation. How can we think that he's going to be able to make good, informed decisions about child-friendly cities in the future if he's not talking about kids? He's admittedly said they've had a lot of conversation about disability, wheelchairs, and certainly that's important, and a stroller is acting much like a wheelchair. An elderly. How do el elderly get around the city? What we need to, in our, in, in our opinion in Urban 95, is that not just that a, kiddie, kid, a city that works for an eight or an 80 year olds, but literally an eight day old. One of the things that I've certainly learned, having been involved in this for 20 years, uh, that I recognize that I've been part of the problem for this, not part of the solution. Because 20 years ago, I should have been thinking about what's the best play experience along with five-year-olds and eight-year-olds and caregivers where babies going to be incorporated. And we built over 17,000 spaces without the intentionality. Kids aren't pieces. They're whole. Yet a lot of times the society we treat them as pieces, programs. You get this program, or you get that program, or you get this activity, they're whole kids. And our solution needs to be whole communities for whole kids, which means the youngest amongst us and the eldest. And how do we design that into our public spaces? Um, so that literally an 80 year old and an eight day old could sit together or sit apart, but have a, a, a, an enjoyable, um, experience in those. Um, so Urban 95 is this inquiry about more and more uh, kids are living in cities than ever before. Many cities are not experiencing the actual um, blight that used to happen where young people, professionals would move into the city and when they started to have kids they'd move out. That's not happening. And more and more people are moving to cities. You know, the statistic is, is that by 2050, 80 some odd percent of the world's population are going to live in cities. And when you think about cities of this size, 15 million, and when you think about the city of the size of Delhi, 50 million, and you start to project that into the future, we certainly have to do things differently. We have to do things differently going forward, and we have to do things differently to what we've already got. And I would say that it's probably not going to be people like me who are going to come up with those ideas. It's going to be the young idealist in the room. It's going to be you. It's going to be somebody sitting next to you. It's going to be one of your contemporaries in another university that's going to have three things uh, that in retrospect I look back um, that I've been able to build at Kaboom. Is that I think play, the experience of play, um, helps you find passions. What you're passionate about. Maybe not what you're good at, or what other people think you're good at, but what are you passionate about? What do you want to spend your time on? And then how does that passion drive into a sense of purpose? And that purpose starts to become what drives you. I've been driven by a sense of giving back to a community because a community has given so much to me. Imagine if every young person has that same obligation, that same sense of both gratitude but purpose in life that says, if not for my parents, my siblings, my community, I would have what I have. And it's my obligation to make sure the future generations get it as well. There's a great burden because the problems are immense, but there's a great opportunity to find and chart a path for yourself that could be incredibly rewarding personally, for your family, for your community, and financially. It's not a trade-off. It's not mutually exclusive. And it's the idealist of the world 
that's going to look at the world's challenges that we haven't been able to solve to this date that we just make worse. Climate change, shifting population, and we've got to make them better faster, including for kids. I just saw yesterday that UNICEF put out a global report that 7,000 babies die in the world every day. 7,000 babies die because of malnutrition. We can produce anything, almost anywhere, but we let 7,000 kids die. Are we putting our purpose in prioritizing kids if that was the case? When we put our will towards things, we find levers large enough to change the trajectory and to lift any weight that's possible. If we find the will to do it. I'm joyous that I certainly found my path along the way. And in finding my path, um, I've been able to make a small dent in the world. And if the dent that I make here tonight is simply by one of you or two of you, say, kids, the elderly, community, homelessness, whatever it might be, is something you want to commit your life to, I feel like I've done my duty. And secondarily, if you commit to looking at Istanbul and wherever you live, and what street do you cross, what do strollers experience look like, and how can I make that better? Uh, how can I make a young father who's carrying a newborn, and the newborn may be crying to not shush it, as sometimes we do in public space? How do we make sure with our own eyes we make kids visible in communities and highlight the caregivers who are caring for them? Because again, no matter where we've come from, the only thing in common is that we were all kids once. We may not all be parents in the future, but we were all kids once. Um, and I could go on forever, but I want to hear what you have to say. I want to ask, answer questions, debate, discuss. What do you have to say? Oh, come on. Somebody's going to have some question. This is something new. <clears throat> um, I think uh, my question is, um, do you have a delicate balance of working with both policymakers and also communities? Uh, and I think uh, I would like to hear a little bit more. When did you decide to put your effort into actually the policymakers? Because you, you started from the community side, um, but then where did the shit happen? Um, so good and fair question. I think two things. One is that what's true for one audience doesn't necessarily mean it's true for another audience. And you have to figure out the audience that you're dealing with, how to authentically engage them. So we perfected, I think, at Kaboom, how to engage an audience at the community level. How to, how to really co-create things. Um, that in the co-creation, we're not just making them unwilling participants in the change that we want to see. We're making them co-creators in the change that they want to see. And then prioritizing the things that they need. And then over time, though, uh, what became increasingly more frustrating at Kaboom was the more playgrounds that we build, the more requests that we got. And so as a nonprofit organization, we had to literally continue to stop and ask ourselves, what problem are we trying to solve? But more importantly, what scale are we trying to solve it at? And in the latter point, if we're simply boutique, bourgeois, and build nice playgrounds, that was good. But the frustration of having more demand than what we could meet and not figuring out how the demand could be met other places, um, shame on us. And the other place for us was policy making. And if we had good policy making, we could both prevent problems from happening in the future in terms of, um, for instance, two examples. Uh, when neighborhoods are being planned 
We generally don't plan where the nursery schools are going to be. But we should understand who's living there, who do we think is going to live there, and where is their nursery school going to be at before we even break ground on anything else. Um, so policy making sets barriers to master planning and, and building communities. The second one is if we have an elementary school, and in many communities, uh, costs and time and space are, are constricted. We don't have as much space, and we don't have as much money to do everything. So if we build a school, and in many cases we don't build playgrounds with that school, but in the cases where we do, how do we make sure that that um, um, playground is used when um, the kids can benefit from it most, which is after school and on weekends and during summer breaks and holidays? It, it's more, more frustrating than not to see a very nice playground at a school behind a fence and the, the community arguing that they have no place to play. They have a place to play, but we haven't figured out what's the best means and way to open up that schoolyard to make it a community playground so that when kids are in school, it's used by the school, but when the kids aren't in school, it's used by the community and the kids who are in the community. We can figure that out. That's a policy level decision around maintenance, liability, um, uh, you know, design, co-designing the function. You would design the playground differently. Maybe instead of putting it in the back of the school, you would put it in the front of the school. Maybe you would separate it further away. Interestingly enough, we did do one experiment on this in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, uh, we built a playground. It was open to the community. And the playground was like 100 meters from the school. And initially, the teachers hated the idea. I gotta send my kids out to school and they're gonna go there, and then I'm gonna tell them to come back and they're gonna get here, and they're gonna do it in 20 minutes? The unintended consequence, which nobody knew before we did this, was we went back a year later and we asked the teachers, what do you think of it now? And they said, brilliant! You knew about this all along. We, we knew about what? Well, the kids come back from that run back, tired. They sit in their chair, and instead of working the wiggles out, their wiggles are worked out, and we can get back to educating them. So the unintended consequence of placing further away actually gave this transition zone that was better than having it right next to the school, which was where it was before. They get done playing, the whistle blows, they got to go inside, and they're not done yet. Now they've got this transition process back into the classroom, uh, and they were more able and capable to learn quicker than, and it was the teachers who made this up. That wasn't a research project, and it wasn't even intentional that we did it that way, um, to be quite honest. Um, so from a policy, policy making also gets to resource allocation. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say this, I saw on the Istanbul 95 website that you look at the concentration of where young kids live, you look at the concentration of income, it's no coincidence that there are more and better playgrounds where fewer kids live but higher income kids live. Versus, versus where the really dense communities are but they're low income. I see the guy who did the math um, shaking his head very vigorously, but visually representing that was so powerful to show the injustice and to try to change that injustice to say, we as a society could and should do better. And now we've got a tool here in Istanbul, and I want to see that tool repeated uh, elsewhere in the world, that helps people come to those conclusions, not anecdotally, but factually. Because we have data to prove it um, factually. Other questions? Yes. We are coming from a, a number of organizations about kids and uh, we are running a project about uh, we are running a project about uh, making this family friendly too. Not much as you do, but we are trying to. Uh, we are very hard times uh, making uh, keeping the community and to and to start uh, helping community helping. Uh, you say uh, the, uh, 
the best thing is making small steps for uh, making help the community. Are there any clues you want to uh, share with us uh, about making a community together energy and helping? Yeah. So in our experience, what we found is that um, um, the first thing we would suggest communities ironically to do is a spaghetti dinner. Because spaghetti is really cheap. Almost anybody can make it. You can make a lot of it really easy. And um, generally, people like it. And so if you're living in a housing flat and you want to think about bringing people together, we suggest them to do a spaghetti dinner, but only charge like a dollar. Make the barrier so low that everybody wants to be there. Everybody wants to participate. And when they're there, use that as your enrolling chance. Because what ha generally what happens is that we go one by one. Will you support this project? Will you support this project? And not to say that's not a bad thing, but if you two work together, you kind of know each other, if you see each other in the hallway, you assume the other person supports the project. And when you see 20 people at a spaghetti dinner, and people start to talk about where you at that spaghetti dinner, and they're like, what spaghetti dinner? I forgot about it. Who else was there? And before you know it, people want to convince themselves that they were at that first spaghetti dinner. And we have to find means to get people around this common cause and keep getting it back to the common cause and easy for them to participate. The next spaghetti dinner should have 30 people at it and then 50 people at it. And the more that we can do things where it's not an outside in, it's an inside out, it's the residents really seeing that it's only going to be successful if it's for and by them, and that you as the NGO become a tool, an instrument, and it becomes your highest and best use, then you've got that magic to spread. But it's magic. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's not easy. Uh, but making the barrier to entry, like food, and so it's inexpensive, where it draws the largest number of people, and then from the largest number of people, uh, set the date and time for the next one, so that they know when it's going to happen again. And then make it repeatable, repeatable, repeatable um, after that. Uh, and the, the other thing I would say is, from a public space um, perspective, um, as I said earlier, kids love kids. So when we, what we find with when we have these get outside campaigns, we have adults. But get kids outside. Get a couple of kids. Make them visible. So that other people see it and it becomes an invitation. And that invitation becomes, I want to be there. My sibling's down there. My sibling's friend's down there. And that's what we want to try to snowball um, as we create this through here. Any other questions? Yeah. Like the feedback that you get after like, working on this project over 20 years, when did you start to get the feedback and see the impact that you have made on the society and the kids? So when was the time that you realized that you are doing something that's actually helping the people and helping the kids the impact that you have made? Yeah, so I mean, I think really early on, I remember, um, I remember in Nice Town, Philadelphia, uh, I mean, Nice Town, New Jersey is, is an example, and um, we had a construction fence uh, put up around the project, and a young child, five or six years old, of some range, um, was behind the fence because it was still a construction site and saw their mother on the other side finishing up a chore. And the child yelled to the mother, Mother, you really built this? And to see the mother's pride, to see the joy in the interaction that just took place, for the child's a little bit of kind of disbelieving, we knew we were making a difference. Now, you know, in the, in the world of data, there's outputs and outcomes. And the outputs are, you build 17,000 playgrounds. Are the outcomes, are the kids smarter? Are they healthier? Are they more social? You know, we have longitudinal studies on some of the benefits of both of our playgrounds, but play in general. And we can absolutely say that the money that you invest in playgrounds improves the public health, improves the property values, uh, in, improved socialization in terms of the social contract and vandalism goes down, crime goes down, 
uh, and the number of eyes on the street um, goes up. Um, so all of that data um, certainly um, exists, but beyond the data existing, uh, we really want to make it about uh, the common cause of is it built enough, is it big enough that the tent welcomes everybody in it? And if everybody is in the tent, can we move this needle far enough where we bridge some of the divides that so many people in our world, including kids, face every single day? Going back to the brain science uh, real quick, there's this Harvard uh, professor, Jack Shonkoff, who runs the Center for the Developing Child. And because we know more about the brain now than we've ever known before, he scared the hell out of a lot of us when he basically said there's this notion called toxic stress. And when kids are under this constant bereavement of pain, suffering, poverty, um, malnutrition, pollution, um, their brain physically changes. And the first things that change in their brain constitution is their ability to empathize and their degree of resistance. Two things you actually need most to survive in a deprived situation. And the antidote to correcting toxic stress, ironically, is caring adults and play therapy. So the question becomes, do we want to support caring adults up front, or do we want to screw up kids and have to fix them with other caring adults who are not their parents, who are not their caregivers or grandparents? Do we want them to have choice and play up front, or do we have to give them play therapy after we've already messed them up? I would argue that we've got to do the upfront work better and faster and for every kid and not leave a single kid um, behind. Uh, thank you for this inspiring talk. Uh, we look at the cities now more or less from 95 centimeters, from say 50 to 95, but how about 150 to 200? So how about their parents actually? Because especially for the very young children, we cannot disregard their parents because that's the only way they are mobile in the city. What are their needs in, in your opinion when they go out to the public space? Yeah, great question because you know, part of it is by focusing on such a small audience, zero five, zero to three, the first 1,000 days, it almost makes us sound agnostic to kids being zero to 12, kids being zero to 18, the needs of caregivers and all those things. Ironically, what's also true besides all of us being kids, their parents were kids once too. And it's hard to imagine to have happy, joyous kids if you don't have happy, joyous adults. The kids mimic what's happening in school, what's happening in the church, what's happening in the school, I mean at home. And they know and they feel the stresses. They know if their parents aren't finding joy and happiness. And that creates some of the toxic stress. So everybody does better when they play. Particularly for caregivers with young kids, we have to do things like in the environment, uh, making sure that if you have a toddler, 0 to 18, that you either still have to carry or in a stroller that are beginning to crawl, places to sit. Shaded places to sit. Restrooms. And some place to get a coffee. If you've got those four things as kind of the baseline, you've met a lot of the demands that will get uh, caretakers um, to socialize in play groups in public space. But if you don't have a bathroom, you've created that hassle factor, right? Because they're only going to be able to go there for a certain number of time. They generally don't invite other people where there's not bathrooms because everybody's schedule is not the same. And then it becomes about scheduling. So, you know, you've got to look at those four ingredients first and take care of for what's in it for them. 
And when you take care of what's in it for the caregivers, it trickles down to uh, what's in it for the kids too. And then there's a whole other layer of compounding things that go on it. Caregivers like to be inspired. So saturate the place that they live with positive messages about what they could do with their child and the benefit of uh, doing laundry together, asking the child to fold or roll up socks. Um, so providing the parents with tools and prompts where they live that's contextually relevant and then to see everybody in the community reinforcing that so that it becomes the norm, not the exception. So a lot of it is about how do you nurture supporting environments, and then how do you get the crowd large enough? And if the crowd's large enough, it becomes the socially acceptable behavior versus you're, you're the one standing out and doing things um, possibly um, different. Um, I'm gonna go through two more slides and we'll take a couple more questions. How do you put this into practice? It takes work. And what we found is a, a couple of key ingredients. Always start with the community no matter what the problem is. Seems obviously, but when you start with the community, don't go in there and study them. Study with them. <laughs> Many times, uh, what we find, and I live in Tirana, Albania now, and I work for uh, the mayor there. Um, when we go out and do a survey, most people tell us, this is the 10th time we've been surveyed by the World Bank, by UNDP, by UNICEF. Please don't survey us anymore. Don't ask us what you, we think, right? That's not starting with the community. Um, I met this guy in uh, Copenhagen um, earlier this year. And he said, when I start with the community, I go down to the space that I want to impact because he's a community organizer. And he says, I sit there for a month and I let people ask me what I'm doing here. I don't tell people what I'm doing here. I ask, I let people ask me. They start to see me come back every day. They see me sitting here for three hours, four hours, five hours. They become curious, what am I doing? And when I'm not gone tomorrow, and when I'm not gone next week, they know that I'm here to work with them, not for them. And they open up in a different way. A lot of time we become transactional, not transformational. A lot of times we're about Facebook, not FaceTime. And sometimes we just need to see actual real faces over and over and over again because that's what the social contract is all about. So start with the community in a different way. Don't go in there once, don't go in there twice. Look at how you're gonna go in there over a long period of time so that you really understand what you're talking about and understand um, um, there. Focus on the strengths, not on the weaknesses. We've all got weaknesses. They're all things about all of us. And every time somebody tells me I suck at this or suck at that, I say, yeah, you're probably right, but I'm not gonna go fix it. But it goes back to the example of if I play music and I wanna learn to cook, and there's somebody in my community who can teach me music, or that I can share my cooking with, that's a great thing. You're building off what already exists instead of breaking down the things that don't exist and possibly that people um, can't fix. Find early champions. Um, seems, seems obvious, but, but a lot of times the champions are the usual suspects, not the unusual suspects. When you map the community, when you really understand the community, you're gonna find out who are the ones that always raise their hands, who are the ones that are always going to be on the board? Who are the ones who are always going to be in leadership positions? And it's like musical chairs, they just move around. Find the early champions that are different. Uh, one of the projects that we were involved with in Columbus, Ohio, um, the community association was never really in favor of the project and nobody actually understood why. We had worked on it for three months, had raised over $150,000 uh, on Thursday night, uh, the uh, Thursday morning, the community association basically was saying that they were going to Thursday go to the building commission to tell them that they had not approved the project uh, and that the building permit should be made null and void. And we were supposed to start construction on Monday. We were up against the community association. My buddy John Sarvey and I 
went to all the people who had attended meetings with us for three and a half months, all the people who had given to the spaghetti dinners, and we said, this is about to happen. And not only did we get a um, couple hundred signatures from people who wanted to stop it, on Monday morning, while the construction was supposed to start, uh, we had 50 people show up at the building department to say, we don't know who those people are. Just because they're on the board, they don't represent us. And if you stop us, we'll stop them and vote them out. The construction went forward, and several months later, that community board was voted out. Don't go to the usual suspects. Find new suspects in different ways. Um, Co-create, I don't think I have to say as, uh, as much about that, but um, the one thing I do want to say about this, particularly as design professionals, is that sometimes we know what works and what doesn't work, and it's how you share that information that allows people to make the best choice for themselves. For instance, um, if you're building out of an equipment catalog, um, there's a whole bunch of fancy things that are in there that are expensive, um, that might cost more money. It's a trick. It's where the manufacturer makes their margin. And so the more times they show it in the catalog, is the more, the more obvious it becomes that that's what they want you to buy. But as somebody who's built an awful lot of playgrounds, and then after building the playgrounds, day after day, month after month, year after year, visiting the playgrounds and watching who's using it and how it's being used, I know what equipment generally works for who, and which equipment doesn't work, and why? And just because it costs a lot of money doesn't mean it's the best thing, but it's how you co-create that process with people um, that doesn't throw anybody under the bus, but also allows them to make the best decision for themselves and the money that they have by framing those choices. They still may choose the shiny nickel, um, and that's okay. But as someone who's built a lot of playgrounds, in the co-creation process, I'm going to try to steer you towards what my experience without you even know you're being guided. <coughs> Final things, uh, embrace change and flexibility. The world is changing faster than it's ever changed before, and we have to deal with it. What works today isn't going to be the same thing that works tomorrow, and what works in Istanbul may not be the thing that works in Tirana, and the thing that works in Tirana may certainly not be the thing that works in Copenhagen. We have to be flexible, but we, that doesn't mean we change our principles. Our principles remain solid. How we do it uh, may change. Think long term. Uh, we had this. Uh, in, we were in a meeting this morning with park and rec professionals, and the first question they ask is about maintenance. And if you're a park and rec person, the first question you should ask about is maintenance, because you're responsible for it. And you're not just responsible for one park, you're probably responsible for hundreds of parks. And do you want to spend all your time fixing problems? No. So as advocates, we have to help them solve their problem by talking about and not hiding maintenance costs money, maintenance takes time, but what are the best decisions that we can make in terms of maintenance up front? than dealing with what we know may be problems down the road, but we're happy that we built this thing that can go in another catalog. And, and again, um, if you're just doing research or if you just want a project for your portfolio, you're gonna think short term. But you're, you're short term in the community, and that's not what they need. They need long term engagement. Owners build community, and uh, I would say this final one, um, measure individual and collective uh, impact. A lot of us are in a dual part purpose. We're trying to change hearts and minds. And it goes back to the first question that was asked. What are policymakers going to want to know? The data that they may need, the cost factors, that's one thing. Versus a community member on the ground and what they may need to be inspired, to be lifted up, to have a light shined on them, to told them, to somebody to tell them that they value what they did, to say please and to say thank you, that's something totally different. And frankly, in terms of being flexible and nimble, we as people gotta do both. The age of specialization is almost over. 
And as young people going out to make your mark, to start your careers, to reinvigorate your careers, find the places that you can have individual and ample ripples of collective impact and let that measure up um, over time. I think with that, I'll say thank you and good night and really thank uh, Studio X, Superpool, and all the good people that I've literally met in the two days that I've been here and that we're gonna continue to meet tomorrow. Uh, I'm not lying when I say I've literally been all over the world. It's not a joke that I've built over 17,000 playgrounds. I read the briefing materials before I showed up here yesterday afternoon, and it's all true, but it's even better than I knew. There are more things happening here in Istanbul. There are more people who are starting to line up around putting kids first, and not just putting them first, but giving them what's best, than maybe any other place that I've been to, certainly in the last year. That's an exciting thing to be a part of. It surprised me, but it also delighted me because I think I now have an obligation and responsibility to track your progress. And then not only track your progress, make sure other people in other parts of the world know about the good people, the good organizations, and frankly, the great work that's happening now and the great work that's gonna to continue to happen because of people who are gathered around uh, rooms like this on Thursday night. So humbly, thank you very, very much. Thank you.